a morning harbour site. Uh, today, I am going to uh, read uh, two readings. Uh, so please join me to leisurely go through 48 verses in three minutes. <laughs> okay, rock and roll. Um, chapter 10, Acts 1 to 28. At Caesarea, there was a man called named Cornelius, uh, Cornelius, uh, beg your pardon, Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. <clears throat> he gave generously to those in need and prayed in, uh, to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? he asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come out as a memorial offering from God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that has happened and sent them to Joppa. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter came, uh, went up to the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was thinking about the vision, the spirit came to him and said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, We have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the man into the house to be his guest. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelia met and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I am only a man myself. While talking to them, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, You are aware, well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. Next reading, Acts 10, 34 to 48. 
Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who, was, who were under the power of the devil, because God is with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who, are, who, uh, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God anointed as judge of the living and of the dead. All the prophets, uh, all the prophets testified, testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then, Jesus, uh, then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. Hallelujah. <laughs> ah, thank you. Thank you, May. Well done, a mammoth reading. Who chose that long reading? <laughs> Oh, it was awesome. Thank you, May. You read so well. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to church. It's great to be here this morning, gathered together as God's people, hey? Just singing together and hearing God's word uh, spoken like that, it's so encouraging. I want to let you guys know that we met yesterday. We had a mammoth day together as a staff and as a leadership team. Our leadership team here at church is called the Steering Committee, and 12 of us, staff and that and that committee met together for a whole day planning and praying and seeking God for the vision of the church. And I'm just so encouraged. Pip and I have been talking about it so much. It was just a great day of unity in Christ. You should be very thankful for the staff and the steering committee, the leadership here at the church. And I think it's really fitting for what we had yesterday, a great day of unity for the vision God has given us, because that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about unity. Uh, hey, we heard before some pretty great things coming up in the life of the church. Hey, that parenting night. Who doesn't want to be a bit more of a confident parent? I'll take some of that. Amen. Hey, invite your friends. It, it, it's an event for not really for the church. You know, it's, uh, it's not going to be a Christian thing. Okay, so we want people from the community to come and be blessed. So hand out those things at school. I reckon that's going to be uh, oversubscribed that night. It's going to be great. So many great Christmas things coming up as well. Chances to reach out to our community and invite them in to our space and experience the hospitality of Jesus. So if you've been in church for a little while, 10, 20, 30, 50 plus years, some of us that'll be the case, or if you've been part of church for a few months, a year, whatever it is, I reckon you would have experienced something maybe not so pleasant about church life. Division, right? Division, factions, disagreements, conflicts, arguments, all of which can sometimes bubble over into some significant things like rifts or even church splits. 
I met someone, I spent a whole day workshop with a guy called Tim, whose full-time job it is to mediate conflicts in churches. That's all he does, and he is kept very, very busy. This man has an infinite amount of patience. I don't think I could do his job. He's a wonderful gift to the church, and he is really, really busy. And I was reflecting on that after I spent this day workshop with him, and it kind of made me sad. It made me sad to hear that, oh, there's so many churches out there experiencing, experiencing significant conflict. Now, I don't want to be naive, okay? I am an idealist. I am an optimist. And but I don't want to be that naive to think there's never going to be disagreements in the church, okay? We don't want to be that naive. There's going to be differing opinions, disagreements in the church. Conflict is a normal part of life, a normal part of church life. And you know what? Not all conflict is bad, We're going to do a whole message on conflict sometime soon. Not all conflict is bad because out of conflict can come a lot of health, right? Can come a lot of healthy outcomes. So we should expect some friction, okay, and some conflict in the church. Surely this is why the New Testament keeps begging us to bear with one another, right? You can't read the New Testament for very long and hear put into practice this thing called love. Bear with one another. This side of eternity, this side of the new creation, I am going to annoy you. If I haven't already, just wait, okay? You are going to annoy me. Most of you already have. No, I'm kidding, but, (laughs) right? We are going to annoy each other. We are going to get on each other's nerves. There are going to be disagreements, differing opinions. There's going to be conflict. And you know what? These are just great times to put into practice this thing Jesus called love love each other. But when conflict turns bad, like when it becomes really significant, then it can be really sad, hey? It can be a tragedy. It can lead to broken relationships, divisions. It can lead to things like church splits. And it's sad, isn't it? Right? It's sad. When things break apart the people of God, when the unity of the church is challenged, It can be a real tragedy. What happened in the early church when they faced some real potential conflict? What happened? How did they deal with it? What happened when they came against an issue that really could have drastically divided the church? That's what we're going to meet today. We see Peter, the apostle, face head on the issue of internal division next week. We're going to look at a great passage in Acts chapter 12, where the early church comes face to face with political tyranny. What's going to happen? Stay tuned for next week. This week, what happens to this young early church when they face internal tension, potential internal division? And here's the point of tension, surrounds this question. Who can be part of the church? This is a real question the early church faced. Who can be part of of this church Jesus is building? Who can be included? When there are real differences between people, should it matter when it comes to the church? The particular issue Peter faced is this, the difference in cultures, the difference in races. That's a, a big issue the early church faced. So you might be thinking... Why are we talking about this today? It's the year 2022. I mean, haven't we already solved this one? Could this possibly have anything to teach us today? Come on, why is this even an issue? So what we're going to have to do, initially, we're going to have to do a little bit of work together, okay? A little bit of work to understand the particular culture and context the Bible was written in, okay? It's not going to be too hard of work, don't worry, Sunday morning, I won't put too much pressure on you. But in order to really mine this for all it's worth, we've got to do a little bit of that, okay? We've got to do that together. Because as we do, I think we'll be surprised at just how relevant this issue is for us today, because we're talking about the topic of church unity. They faced it then, we face it now. I don't know about you, I feel like as a society, we are becoming more divided more polarized, 
feels like the, the lines of division socially, politically, racially, economically are becoming clearer. People are becoming more comfortable in their silos, more isolated within their chosen camps. Here's a question for us. What does the gospel of Jesus Christ have to say about that? Anything? If these issues are in our society, they're bound to be in the church too, right? How does the church respond to that? When we find ourselves with differences, real differences within the church, what do we do? You know, people can be pretty quick to talk about the external threats against the church. They can come against the church. Oh, I think the greatest threats to come against the church, they've got nothing to do with outward persecution. Very little to do with hostility from the world. Greatest threat? Internal division, right? A lack of unity. So that's what we're going to be talking about this morning, unity. What does it look like? How can we practice it? Really fortunate for us, our passage today can help us navigate that. Why? Because God's Word is eternally relevant. Amen? It is eternally relevant relevant. It may not have been written to us, but it is written for us. We've got a lot to, to mine here today. So let's look at this topic of unity. And let me tell you, this probably wasn't the easiest message to write this week. Been laboring over what to include, what not to include. But I pray that you, you, you might give me grace and the benefit of the doubt. As, uh, as I try to apply this to us. So what could be a better thing to do than to pray right now? Can we do that? Can we come together as God's people and pray that he might encourage us and challenge us appropriately this morning? Heavenly Father, we thank you for what we've already experienced as God's people today. May we learn from this great passage of Scripture of what you want us to know, be reminded of, Lord, would you challenge us where we need to be challenged? Would you comfort us where we need to be comforted? In Jesus' mighty name, would you bind us together? Amen. Amen. All right. Let's look at this topic of unity through this great story. We have two main characters. Our first, Cornelius. We meet him first time. We've met him in the story so far. We're in our series called I Will Build My Church. We are looking at the fifth book in the New Testament, it's called Acts, and really, it's the history of the church, volume one, and we're at Acts chapter 10, and we are meeting a new man called Cornelius, and we witness something pretty fantastic in his life. We witness, we witness his conversion to Christ. Then we meet our second character, Peter. We know Peter pretty well. We've met him in the Gospels. We've met him so far in the book of Acts, and while, of course, he's already a follower of Jesus, in this story... He undergoes such a transformation, such a change, that some people have called this passage not the conversion of Cornelius, but the conversion of Peter. All right, let's meet our first character, Cornelius. Who is he? We're told he's a Roman soldier of some standing. Fairly important man living in Palestine in more of a Roman area. And for our story today, the most important thing is he's a Gentile. He's not a Jew. That's just what that word means, Gentile, non-Jew. However, this guy Cornelius seems to worship the God the Jews worship, right? He follows the, the God of, of the Old Testament, of the Bible. He's generous to the poor and he prays to God. Last week, we saw the amazing conversion of Saul, who was totally anti-Jesus. This week, we see Cornelius, who seems to be fairly warm, fairly open, Cornelius, we know, gives to the poor and he prays. And during a moment of prayer, he receives a vision from God. We see a couple of visions in this passage, don't we? He receives a vision from God. God says to him, send some men to go and collect a guy called Peter and bring him back. Cornelius does so. Then the focus moves to our second character, Peter. Peter is also in a time of prayer, also receives a vision. But his is way weirder. It is weird. Right, he, in a time of prayer, God is clearly working behind the scenes to make something happen, hey? 
always, but very clear here. Peter is feeling hungry when he's praying. He's getting distracted. Anyone else had that moment? I certainly have. <laughs> Peter smells some cooking. Man, that's tough. That's, that's going to send you on distraction mode. Peter smells something cooking, and he falls into a trance. And then things get really weird. A sheet is dropped down from heaven, a huge one, right? And, and on that sheet, there are lots of animals, all kinds, reptiles, birds. And then a voice from heaven says, hey, Peter, get up, kill and eat. What is going on here? No idea. Let's pray. Okay. There's so much I could say, but let me just simply say this. These animals represent the food laws that set Israel apart from the other nations, okay? God had clearly instructed his people, Israel, before they entered the promised land to be different. And one way they were going to be different, they were going to eat different things. That's all we really need to know for today, okay? Their diet was really different. Orthodox Jews now follow a kosher diet similar to what these people would have experienced back then. This has been part of Peter's entire life, part of the Jewish way of life for hundreds of years. You are to be different, and what you eat is going to be different too. Now, how, now, but, but God is saying, all of that, Peter, don't worry about it anymore. What? Really? I thought that was important to you. No, not anymore. Big day. How does Peter react? Peter replies, no way. I'm not going to do that. Lord, you know, I've never broken any of these laws. I'm not going to start now. That's, that's all impure and unclean. What does God say? He says, Peter, don't call anything impure that I have made clean. This happens three times, just so we can get through Peter's head. I don't blame him, though. It's a big shift. Happens three times. While Peter's thinking, what on earth is going on? Cornelius' men turn up downstairs. Okay, let's unpack what's happening. The vision Peter receives with the animals is meant to represent far more than just the dietary laws of the Jews. Okay? It represents a long-standing cultural division in that time and place, the division between Jew and Gentile. That's what it's meant to represent, the vision. It's about clean and unclean animals, but really it's about clean and unclean people. Let me say that again. The vision's about animals, but really it's about people. Clean and unclean people. The Jews at that time viewed Gentiles and non-Jews as unclean. God's saying, not anymore. No way. Now, for us modern Australians, okay, I admit, it's, it's difficult for us to grasp what is going on here. That this is weird, right? This is, we feel very removed from this. It's hard for us to understand the gulf that existed between Jew and Gentile back then. Even if there was someone like Cornelius, who was, you know, fairly integrated almost into the life of the Jewish folk. But back then, socializing, relating together, eating together, even entering into each other's homes was just not done. Absolutely not done in that time and place. But here's the thing. The Old Testament never taught or encouraged this. That's why you see Jesus spending so much time with the Gentiles, if you read the Gospels, right? He spends time with the Gentiles, and he even affirms people of Gentiles saying, your faith is, wow, I haven't seen anything like this. And it really ticks off the religious people, the Jewish people of the day. Jesus was very good at that. See, the Jews were meant to be different, of course, but they were meant to be different in a different way. They were supposed to be a light to the world. They were supposed to be different. So the other nations would go, wow, that's God? I want to worship him. That was why they were supposed to be different. Okay, it, the, God's intention was never to have them isolated, right? It, it was never meant to turn into this, this thing of nationalism. And what it turned into was racial pride. It turned into racism. Jewish folks would refer to Gentiles as dogs. It was never God's intention. It had, it had been twisted and turned into something gross. God is doing something about it. So this is the cultural sea that Peter is swimming in. Okay, it's where he's from. And now he's just received a clear sign from God rebuking his nationalistic pride. Don't you dare call unclean anything that I've made. Everyone is made in my image. No such thing as an unclean person. Smashing down barriers. 
In this vision, God is clearly showing Peter what's always been his intention, right? This division between Jew and Gentile, it ends today. Big moment. As I've mentioned earlier, right? This story is about the conversion of the first Gentile, Cornelius. So it's really important in, the, 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 in church history. But it's actually also about the conversion of Peter, right? The transformation he had to go through in order for God to work through him. Because what we're talking about here is what? We're talking about prejudice. We're talking about entrenched prejudice. Is that an issue for us today? What do you think? You see, if Peter had not received this vision, Cornelius' men would have turned up, and what would Peter have done? Would have sent them packing. But because God intervenes, it doesn't happen. Peter invites the men to stay with them, and the next day he goes traveling with them. Let's move to the final scene of this great story. I'm trying to get through it really quickly so we can spend some time on some application. So sorry for the breakneck speed, but I know you can handle it. Next scene and final scene, our two characters meet, Peter and Cornelius. You can tell Cornelius is excited. He's invited every single person he knows. The place is rammed. He is pumped. He is pumped to have Peter come and speak. But let's just think about Peter for a second from his perspective. I wonder if he hesitated on the threshold of Cornelius' home. I wonder if he did. First time he ever would have stepped into a non-Jewish person's home. I wonder if he hesitated, you know. But he does it. It's a big day for him. And he's honest about it. He enters the home, says hi to Cornelius. Cornelius tries to worship him. He says, oh, please don't. I'm just a man like you. And then he's really honest. He says to everyone gathered there, hey, you guys probably know it's against our tightly held custom for me to even be here, but God has shown me this is what needs to happen. Barriers are coming down. Walls are being smashed. Peter can't deny it. God is clearly orchestrating things behind the scenes. This is just another example of Jesus leading the church where it would not have chosen to go on its own. And thank God for that. Peter asks Cornelius to tell him his side of the story. Cornelius does. And then he says, hey, we are really excited to hear the message that you have for us today. And that's how I feel every Sunday. You guys are like that. We are so excited to hear the message that you have. But man, to hear how receptive these people are to hear from God through Peter. Peter begins his message. And of course, it's all about Jesus, his life and his ministry, his death on a cross, his resurrection, proving his victory over death. People witness that. Peter's one of them, and he tells them. Jesus is now the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He rules and reigns, and everybody, I guess even Gentiles, can receive forgiveness of sin through him. I love this bit. We talked about it in Star of Devotion. While, while Peter is speaking, the Holy Spirit comes. Not when he's finished, while he's speaking. The Holy Spirit says, all right, Peter, that's enough. You've spoken for long enough. The Holy Spirit comes down upon Cornelius and the others gathered there. Amazing. Right? We don't have a lot of detail of what happened, but it's clear what happened to them. It's the same thing of what happened to Pentecost, what happened to Peter and the other followers. They start speaking in tongues. They're praising God. And Peter and the other, the other Jews or Christians, now they open-mouthed. They're astonished. Look what God has done. Surely no one can stand in the way of these people being baptized, becoming part of the family of God. And so they do. It's amazing. It's a great story, isn't it? It's an amazing story. It's an important story. Because unless you have Jewish background, the good news of Jesus doesn't get told to you unless this happens. Up until this point, Christianity is a small Jewish sect And it may have stayed that way if Peter was in charge. But thank God, God was behind the scenes. Now, Christianity explodes over the world, becoming the most culturally diverse religion the world has ever seen, the world has ever known. So it's a pretty important story, isn't it? (laughs) 
This is Jesus Christ building his church. Who's welcome? Who's welcome in that church? It couldn't be clearer, right? Race, culture, not an issue. Okay, so we've, we've gone through the story. What is relevant for us today? I wonder what you think. I wonder what we could apply from this. How might we apply what's happened to us in our time, in our church? Well, what I think this passage brings to mind, what I've already talked about, is the issue of unity. Peter is dealing with a massive potential division in the church, race and culture, right? Division is the opposite for God's purpose, for his heart for the church. His purpose for the church is that we are to be one, one in Christ. Unity is the opposite of division. Here's just a simple, helpful definition of unity here, okay? The unity of the church is rooted in the deep conviction that God's people, it's us, in spite of all their differences, are united to him by faith in Jesus Christ. Let me say it again, right? The unity of the church is rooted in the deep conviction that God's people, in spite of all their differences, are united to him by faith in Jesus Christ. I love that little bit, in spite of all our differences, because they exist. It's not me naive. They exist. So what could come against church unity? What could? There is so much to say on this topic. I want to respect your time. What could come against? Let me just reflect on a few things with our remaining time. What could come against church unity? I think disunity happens when? When those differences become more important to us than our faith in Jesus Christ, right? Pretty clear. Those differences are more important to me than my faith in Jesus Christ that I share with God's people. Now, what might those things be? Let me step on a few landmines. First thing I'm going to call denominational differences. Minor theological differences. Practical distinctives. Or the official term that I like to use is inside church crap. That is the official term. That is, probably should just call it stuff, inside church stuff. That is the direct translation from the Greek, inside church crap. I've experienced lots of this in my time in the church, and I bet you many of us have. Arguments around music styles, placement of the band, on stage or off stage, who's preaching, and for how long are they preaching? It's always a good one. What part of the stage should the lectern be? What should it even be called? A pulpit? A lect- where should it be? Hands up in the air when we're worshipping or hands down by our side? Are the gifts of the Spirit alive today or not? Many, many, many more issues. My goodness. So many more. I just I don't want to go on about this. I don't want to get bogged down, but let me say two quick things about these denominational differences inside church stuff. First thing I want to say is this. Everyone outside the church could not care less. Everyone outside the church couldn't care less about most of these issues. The amount of time that is so often wasted in the church, wasted on arguing and often infighting over these things, in my opinion, is shameful and distracts us from why we're really here. It distracts us from speaking about the hope of Jesus to this area. Do you know how many lost people are in this area? Tens of thousands. How do we want to spend our time arguing or united in Christ, sharing the hope of Jesus? That's why the devil loves foolish conflict, because it distracts us from why we should be here. Amen? Amen. Amen. Second thing I want to say about this inside church stuff is I I believe we must be very careful what we place in our non-negotiable box, in our non-negotiable circle. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean this. 
I won't have fellowship with that genuine brother or sister in Christ if they fill in the blank. I'm not going to hang out with that genuine believer if they don't, if they do, you fill in the blank. What is it for you? How many things fill in the blank for you? See, we, we've got to keep Jesus central, no question. We've got to keep the gospel of Jesus Christ central, absolutely. And we fight for that. And we let many other things hang loose. I believe the Bible calls for unity, not uniformity. There is a difference. See, I'm glad there are different expressions of the church. I am so glad people think differently to me. The world would be so boring if they didn't. Because we can learn from each other, can't we? Shouldn't we remain curious when it comes to people who practice their faith differently to us? Other believers? God is so much bigger than we think, amen? I hope and pray this is a value and a culture that we are passionate about here at Harborside Church. Right, because so many of us come from different backgrounds of church. Right, we take Jesus very seriously, and we hold many other things pretty loosely. It doesn't mean we don't have a particular flavor as of church. Of course, we do, and we have to make decisions of how to do things. We just have to. We can't be all things to all people, and that will mean some people won't feel at home here. Okay, it's too contemporary. It's not contemporary enough, and so on and so forth. I get it. That's okay. But may we never think our way is the only way. No way. Okay. Have I annoyed you yet? Just wait. All right. What else? As I said before, I think we are living through a particularly divided time politically, aren't we? Exploited, I think, though, let's not be naive, by media and social media, I think. Because nothing drives content consumption and interaction like outrage, right? There's nothing wrong with holding certain political views and holding them passionately. I sure do. But every Christian must remember Jesus' words on this topic, which are, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. Our allegiance is primarily to Jesus. He is the king and to his kingdom. His kingdom is not of this world, meaning his kingdom is not left and it is not right. There are aspects of both camps, left and right, that the gospel would affirm and challenge. Have you thought about that? After the... um, Trump-Clinton election in 2016, which I followed with great interest, I'm sure a lot of us did, Um, lots of Clinton supporters after the result were interviewed and they were crestfallen. They were in shock. They could not believe anyone in their right mind would vote for Trump. They just couldn't believe it. Why? Because everyone in their circle, every single person they knew was voting for Clinton. 80 million people voted for Trump, and they didn't know one. They're an echo chamber. How could anyone else think differently to me? Now, as a Christian, what do we think about that? What do we do with that? If we say things, go on out of limit, if we say things like, I can't believe anyone would think like that. I can't believe anyone would vote like that. Maybe we're just telegraphing our bias. My guess is there's someone in this very room that does think differently to you. So we're going to find out. Okay, who thinks that? (laughs) No, we're not. Now, I'm not saying there aren't Christian standpoints to take on some issues. Of course there are. But there are a lot of Christian people that sit on different sides of the fence when it comes to issues. And I bet that's represented here. How would you feel? Is it inside that non-negotiable for you? Oh, I'm not going to have fellowship with... Is that true for you? What does the gospel of Jesus Christ say to that? What does unity in the church say when those issues 
come to the fore. Maybe we could start by listening. Maybe we could start by finding out why people do think differently to us. Could that be a start? Could that be a grace-filled thing to do? Could that foster unity? Listening and love, wouldn't that be a great and simple act of humility? You see, I think this is a time for the church to shine like a light and lead. Caleb made this point in Star of Devotion this week, and it's a great one. At this moment in time, as, as these lines of division become clearer, in some ways it's actually easier for the Christian to go, oh, okay, that's the line I need to cross. That's what I need to do to live out the gospel, to live out unity. That's what I need, you see? Oh, right. <laughs> that's the, this is the challenge. Okay, what else? I think it, uh, it might be easy for Australians to look elsewhere in the world. When it come, Elsewhere in the world, maybe places like the US or South Africa with their histories of slavery and apartheid and segregation and think, glad we don't have those issues here. You ever thought like that? These issues are of race, culture. They don't really happen here because we don't have those kind of histories. Pretty easy for people to think that. But unfortunately, of course, the sin of racism, it's here too, and it is a sin. The sin of racism is present in our country, in Australia. It's part of our nation's story. It is part of our history, whether you like it or not, it is. And it's still part of our modern society today. Should the posture of the Christian be to actively seek the truth when it comes to the reality of racism in this country and to work towards peace and reconciliation, particularly with our First Nations brothers and sisters, or ignore the issue, pretending things are fine? You tell me. What did Jesus say? The truth will set you free. Should we be pursuing truth and whatever comes from that, and not hide? Or should we just pretend things are okay? You tell me. Particularly when it comes to our First Nations people. Did you know that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islands, Islanders, 54% of them are Christians? You are more likely to be a Christian if you're an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander than any other culture in our country. So in a very real way, these are our brothers and sisters. What's our posture? You tell me. Okay, lastly and quickly. It could be a sermon on each of these things, hey? But lastly and quickly. I know that we live in a nice area in Mossman. I'm not blind. It's beautiful. It's a wealthy area, right? I get it. And I want this church to reflect the area that it's in. So I'm not surprised if it's made up of middle to upper class folk, because that's where we are. But I tell you what, it's a worrying day. A worrying day when there's not more diversity in the church, socially and economically. Now, I have been encouraged by how this church interacts with people from all walks of life. I really have. But may it continue. It's part of our culture I never want to lose. Let me tell you, I'm going to start to worry when this church smells too much like nice coffee and nice cologne and not like cigarette smoke. I'm serious. How do we feel rubbing shoulders with people that are different to us? You see, the church needs to be, should be, must be. The place that someone enters who's not from our community and says, wow, this is different. This is unexpected. You don't see this at the, the social club, at the swimming club, at the sports club, at the young and old, rich and poor, black and white, together in unity. That, oh my goodness, that is better than any evangelism program we could ever cobble together. My hope and prayer is that is the posture, the heart, the value, the culture of this church. May it be. 
may it be. Can I pray? Can I pray that God would challenge us and that he'd work at us? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the diversity of this world that comes from your creative heart and hand. Lord, I ask that we would be a church that celebrates the diversity that comes from you. I pray this place would be a welcoming home for people of all different backgrounds. I ask, Lord, that you would do something in each of our hearts this morning. Are there any prejudices, Lord? Distant, lying dormant, or very present? If they are, would you graciously and kindly by your Spirit just reveal them to us? Is there a sense of privilege? If there is, Lord, I pray that you would humble us. Every good gift comes from your hand. Whatever it is, Lord, reveal it to us so that we can change, so that this place could be a real light to the people in our community, which is becoming more divided and, and far more graceless. May we embody forgiveness and grace in this place, knowing that we received it from you in abundance. We pray all this in the precious, uniting blood of Jesus. Amen.